declare yourself a Freeman? No, I didn't. Someone declared me a Freeman. I never ever called myself a Freeman. I'm not a free man. I don't want to be a noble or a baron, which the actual word comes from barrow, free man. So I don't, I'm not that. I'm not a free man. I was free the day I was born. I've always been free. Because freedom is about choice. And I've always had the ability to make a choice. Always. And if I want to take someone's authority away, it's quite easy. And I can do it in a non-conflictional situation. And I can take the conflict out of it by choosing to do what they ask me to do. And when you choose to do what's asked of you, there's no authority anymore. No one has the upper hand because you've chosen to do it. And the, life is about choices and being given choices. There is always a choice. And every second of every day, you can make a choice to be either better or worse. Okay. Most people perceive that the police were formulated to protect and to serve them. Why do you believe the police were formulated? In essence, what you're saying is absolutely true. But unfortunately, the truth of that matter is that they were only formed to protect one element of society. When you look at society, society means the socially dominant members of any community. And the police were set up to protect that socially dominant element from the likes of the inferiors, us. When you actually go back into the history of the police, which is very fascinating, I would ask anybody watching this to actually do the history of the police of any nation, because it comes from exactly the same principle. There is no, no, none of it will ever change. You can go to at least 53 countries in the world, or legally defined areas in the world, and you will find that the police were created for exactly the same reason. The two reasons they were created was, one, to, to protect the aristocracy from us, to protect their goods, their lifestyle, their possessions from us. The second reason was to create state control of street life because they knew through keeping crime alive, there was a lot of money to be made there. A lot of money. Through keeping crime alive? Absolutely. That's their job, to keep crime alive. Not to solve crime, to keep it alive. What they did is they, they structured what's called a pri private political army and they called them the, the police. Now, the funny thing is they were created by policy and they are ruled by policy and they don't do anything outside of the parameters of policy. And if you take the word police and say it differently, it actually says policy. <laughs> so it's there in your face. And it's always been there. The writing's always been on the wall. It's just whether you, you choose to, to read it or not. Um... When you look at the structure of the police, you, 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 you see uh, command structure hierarchy exactly the same as the army, which has been infiltrated by the Ministry of Funny Handshakes. Um, most of chief superintendents, chief constables, all that really should be called chief Freemason, because 90% of them, if not 100% of them, are free, part of the Freemason fraternity, which is uh, um, that element of it is a papable army. So they're actually doing the work, you know, they, they, they're under paper orders, if you like. Street life needed, needed to be um, contained and controlled because they wanted to maintain that they were going to earn a great deal of money out of crime. Back in sort of 1740s, there was a man called Charles Hitchens who was a, um, this was before any police actually existed. He was what they call a thief taker. Now the thief takers were quite interesting because the thief takers would go and reclaim stolen property and sell it back to the people it had been stolen from. Charles Hitchens run a gang of thieves, according to history, run a gang of thieves who would go and pickpocket and rob people, bring it back to Charles Hitchens, then Charles Hitchens would find out from the descriptions and obviously insignia on whatever they'd stolen, who it belonged to, and go and sell it back to who it had been stolen from. So it was a very lucrative business. Now, he married a, um, um, a lady, and she had come into some money. She actually come in, she sold, her, her dad left her a house, they sold the house, and he got um, 
over 700 pounds at that time, which is a lot of, lot of money, which at that time would have been backed by gold. So it would have been worth quite a lot of money. So anyway, he decided he was going to buy himself a position. And he bought himself the position of High Sheriff of the City of London. There was two of them. He bought this position. He didn't, wasn't elected, he wasn't given it, he bought his position. He then made, did exactly the same, but just run bigger gangs. But using the smoke screen of being the High Sheriff of the City of London. He was then caught doing it. He was actually, um, I'm sure a man was called Jonathan Wilde. That seems to ring a bell. But he basically was his partner in crime. They'd done the dirty on each other and one grasped up the other one and Charles Hishing was suspended on full pay. They investigated him. Couldn't find any uh, validation to any of the investigations and he was reinstated to carry on doing exactly what he was doing. So this man was earning a very profitable living out of the state control of street life, i.e. the thief takers. And that's carried on? Yeah, that's how it carried on. So, in the end, funny enough, he was arrested for sodomy and was tried for homosexuality and um, convicted. If the government could throw a switch tomorrow that would stop all crime and criminal activities, would they throw it? No, they make too much money from it. Because 90% of the crime, or 99% of the crime they perceive that is crime, is actually called victimless crime. There is no victims. And crime can only exist if there is a victim if there is someone who harm, injury or loss was caused to. If you go for a speed camera, who have you injured? Who's, who's had some form of loss? Where's the damage? There is nothing. So it's a victimless crime. If you park in the wrong place and receive a parking ticket, where's the crime? The crime does pay if you're the government. Absolutely. And that's exactly, crime does pay. There's a little saying that's going about at the moment actually that's very, very fascinating. And they're saying, please don't grow cannabis because the police hate competition. Now, no one really gets that, but when you discover that the police and the courts have something called a bribery manager, you start to realise what really is going on. They are not the correctors of crime, they are the instigators of it. And if you want to keep crime and keep crime as a relevance, and earn money off of crime, then you keep people in poverty. Is that why you think alcohol is a real? Alcohol is the biggest way of creating a crime syndicate. Because people will not drink in moderation. Some do, and I'm not <coughs> pigeonholing everybody, I don't want to, I would ban alcohol, I would wipe it off the face of the planet. In a blink, oh, instantly instantly reduce it because you would start to reduce poverty you need to reduce the poverty and you need to alcohol and drug look at alcohol was developed by monks drugs come about from 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 monks everything comes about even swear words come about from monks so when the the the, the lower classes wave their fists and say to the police you're supposed to be here to protect us actually they're wrong they're not there to protect them that's right and nothing, nothing to do with them. They are there to earn as much money as they possibly can off of that element. The courts collect the money, the police enforce the, the, the statutes, um, the courts collect the tax, because it's basically a stealth tax, that's all it is, all statutes are stealth taxes. Um, we just don't see it that way. And the courts are there to collect. And there is a presumption that the way things are done, the way that business is done, there's a presumption on this, but I'm not going to say it's 100% true. But it does sound very interesting. Um, and it does relate back into history. Again, from what I got from someone who saw, seemed to know what he was talking about, which was very fascinating, he said that the money-making orders called statutes are sold to the private sector and the private sector loan the government the money they need to run, i.e. the banking fraternity, the, private, the third sector as they call it. They, run, they loan the government the money to run the government because the money they're getting through taxation, the money they're getting through national insurance basically pays for their lifestyles. So they do need something to run the country with. Not, granted, not all taxation, but a good majority of taxation is going to maintain their lifestyles. 
So what they do is they create these statutes and they work out on an average that this statute's going to, oh, let's say for argument's sake, 10 billion. It's going to create 10 billion. So they'll sell that to the banking fraternity, but the banking fraternity want the principal and interest. They want both. So they'll sell it and we'll say, look, we can get 10. Well, they say, well, I'll tell you what, we'll give you eight. We'll collect the two as, eight as the principal, two as the interest. But what we make over and, on the board, over and above that is ours. So how are you going to maintain we get our money back? Well, we'll get the courts to collect it for you. And we'll get the police, the private political army, to enforce it. And then the courts will collect it. And then we can pay you back that way and every, anything that's over and above my board. Now the funny story is that these are called gilts and they're sold at Downing Street. They have auctions at Downing Street of these gilts, these statues. But if you go back into the history of Downing Street, you actually find out that before it ever became 10 Downing Street, first thing it was, was a cockfighting pit. They used to have a whole cockfight in there. Um, and then, and then funny enough, an, an old, a cock called Old Trojden made its owner 200 pound in 17 something, which is bloody a lot of money at them day, in them days. So, you know, it was, it was very prolific. Then it became a cafe, um, and it was a cafe where crooks would go, thieves would go to sell their stolen wares, to fence stuff. And isn't it funny how someone told me that that's exactly what the directors of the corporation are doing at 10 Downing Street, they're fencing stolen wares. Because it's all pretense, it's all it's not real, none of it's real, it's just this is how it works. But this is how the banking this is why the bankers are so involved in it. But then you need to know who controls the bankers and who's looking after the bankers and who they really work for. Yeah. And then you start to get a bigger picture of it, which I won't go into because it's quite complex. But and it's only my perspective at the end of the day. None of this is I don't want anybody to take this as fact, I don't want anybody to take it as fiction, I don't want them to take it anyway. I want them to look at it themselves and maybe measure it with their heart. 